So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the June 2018 AETC program eLearn Call. Um, our topic today is understanding the National HIV Curriculum Group functionality. Our speakers are Dr. Kent Unruh of Mountain West AETC and Jeanette Jones from Maytech, Illinois. Um, just a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. If you're dialing in, please mute your computer speakers to avoid hearing feedback. Um, on the line. If you do need to step away to avoid hearing a hold music, please do not place us on hold. Rather, we ask that you call back if you are able. Hang up and call back if you're able. The meeting is being recorded and will be posted to our website along with the slides after the call. Uh, the learning objectives for today are first to briefly review the National HIV curriculum. Uh, to understand the ideas behind the group function, and then we're going to review best practices for its application. And then later on in the call, we'll get us kind of a sneak peek into some new group functionality features that will be released in the next few months. I want to quickly introduce our speakers today. Um, first, we have Dr. Kent Unruh, who is the Informatics Director at Mountain West AETC at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Um, he's got expertise in medical informatics, information science, and socio-technical systems design. Dr. Unruh studies um, users, design systems, deploys IT services, and helps to improve clinical overflow workflows and evaluates the impact of said technology to improve health delivery and educational services. He has published work covering topics in informatics, user-centered user design, and clinical education, and some of the publications where you can find his work are listed here. And we have Shanette Jones, who is the program director for Maytech, Illinois. Her work includes planning and implementing AATC programs and initiatives like in the IPE um, and PT program initiative and um, MAI initiatives as well as others. Uh, Ms. Jones also collaborates closely with her Part A and B agencies to implement trainings tailored for their audiences, and she's committed to providing expert-level HIV clinical training to support healthcare professionals throughout Illinois. Thank you both for joining the call today and for presenting, and I will now turn it over to Kent. Great, um, and I can advance the slides, is that correct? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, it's uh, great to be with you all. Uh, good morning to those of you on the West Coast and good afternoon to those of you elsewhere. Uh, my task is really to provide just a brief overview for the National HIV curriculum to set up the stage for Shanette, who's going to talk about how she uses groups within the uh, larger AETC world. Um, and before I get started, let's see, the slides aren't advancing. There. There we go. Uh, before I get started, I just want to uh, say that when you do a project of this magnitude, it indeed does take a village, and we do have one. We've got an outstanding team of a wide variety of people with different types of expertise all coming to bear on this project, led by Dr. David Spock, the editor-in-chief. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that this is very much a team effort, and it's a privilege to work on this, uh, on this project with this team. Now, one of the first things you'll see and note when you go to the website is that it's very information dense, and you access this site at hiv.uw.edu. And I've just highlighted a couple of the main content areas and sections across the top in the red box. There's a comprehensive antiretroviral medication section, course modules for people who want to work sequentially through the material. There's a question bank that serves up board-style review self-study questions. There's a section on clinical challenges that presents cases that don't fit neatly into clinical guidelines or are particularly challenging at the point of care. There are tools and calculators to help clinicians um, in their clinical work, a master bibliography, and HIV resources. Now, because the site is so dense, we really worked hard at providing two ways to access the information. On the left is the quick reference way, and this is really designed to help people find specific answers to particular questions that emerge. It might be something that emerged in a clinic or something that emerged in a, uh, an AETC training 
where people can quickly drill down into the information, extract what they need, interact with it, and then get out. So it's a very kind of quick access way to get at all the information on this information site. And then the second way is through what we call systematic learning. And this is much more of kind of a support to sequential stepwise learning process where the focus is on choosing one or more modules and making sure that you go stepwise and sequentially through those through the lessons within those particular modules and topic areas to gain a baseline level of knowledge. And so these are the two ways that you can access information on the site. I'm going to use the quick reference just to quickly uh, highlight just a few areas of the content of the site before turning it over to Shanette. Uh, I'm going to start with the antiretroviral medication section. Now, right from the home page, which would be hiv.uw.edu, if I had a question about kind of dosing for dolutegravir and ropivirine and uh, what the, the product label actually uh, says about the dosing, um, I would just simply go take one click in the upper left-hand corner for antiretroviral medications, slide my mouse down to single tablet regimens, and go over to dolutegravir ropivirine, trade name Juluca. So with one click and two slides, I immediately get to um, the dosage and administration. And so this is an example of where I'm able to drill down very quickly to specific information. You'll notice that it's in the context of an editor summary, prescribing information, clinical trials, references, teaching resources. The table of contents is listed along the right. But I really got to where I needed to be with one click and two slides of the mouse. And this is an a great example of how the site is designed to access information very quickly using the quick access functions. Moving on now to the question bank. Um, if I would be, again, I go to the home page, hiv.uw.edu. And uh, if I'm interested in kind of testing my knowledge base on basic HIV primary care with board style review questions, I actually don't have to click anywhere. I could click up in the uh, question bank in the menu, but I'm going to click uh, right here on the website. And um, immediately on the left are all of the different sections within basic HIV primary care. And I'm particularly interested in the cutaneous manifestations, perhaps something emerged in clinic that I haven't seen in a long time. And it really got me thinking um, that I want to figure out kind of where my knowledge is according to the kind of the state of the art of the research right now. So I would click on that, and it would take me to this initial question. You can see that in cutaneous manifestations, there are 10 questions listed across the top. This is the first of the 10. It gives a clinical stem, asks a question, and gives answers that I then choose from. It identifies if my answer is correct or incorrect. The system then provides comprehensive summary and context for that uh, correct answer, and then supplements that with detailed information, which in this particular case is an entire table, guidelines-based table for the recommendations for treating herpes simplex virus infections, um, along with some additional text down below. And then it provides the references as key references as well for further study. And so you can see that the comprehensive nature of the questions in the question bank, and this is for each question within each topic within each module, so it really gives you a sense of the richness that's available to you. Um, my last section I'm going to highlight here are the tools and calculators. These, and I would access those again from the home page, hiv.uw.edu. Um, and there are three basic uh, categories or buckets of tools and calculators available on the site. There's mental disorder screening instruments. There are substance abuse screening tools and clinical calculators for use to calculate clinical values. Um, I'm particularly interested in the uh, PHQ-9 questionnaire because I can use this on an iPad in the clinic um, or as teaching tools in the classroom where we do assessments, you actually fill out the values online. Uh, you can just use your touch screen or a computer or your cell phone. Um, and then it actually calculates the score for you. And it uh, provides the score and then interpretation of your particular score. It helps you with that as well. 
Then the International uh, HIV Dementia Scale is another tool that's available. And I don't know how many of you have used this tool, but it's a, a challenging tool to use if you're not practiced in using it. And what we're able to do on the site is actually provide um, some additional aids to people who are using this, both with patients or who are learning about how to use this in the classroom, um, including um, helping people keep track of the time and do the observations that they need to do to complete this particular scale. And then, of course, like the PHQ-9 that I mentioned earlier, it tabulates the score and helps you interpret the findings based on that score. So I'd like to shift now to the systematic learning aspects because that's really where we're going to spend the bulk of our time and can turn it over to Shanette in just a minute here. Um, course modules I would select from the menu at the top. There are six course modules, screening and diagnosis, basic HIV primary care, antiretroviral therapy, co-occurring co conditions, prevention of HIV, and coming soon special populations. And I'm interested, particularly interested in the antiretroviral therapy as an example. And one of the important concepts for systematic learning is making sure that the learner understands uh, the context or what the goals are for the text and material that they're going to be reviewing. And so each module has explicitly stated learning objectives that you see. I would simply click on the arrow to, to move on. The first topic within this module um, in, includes performance indicators for each topic. And those are listed there. And so now with a very clear idea of what my goals are for this particular topic and this particular module, I'm able to move on to start the material itself. It provides detailed written and visual content. A table of contents is up on the upper right. You can, you can see the level of detail that's available here. The visual information are hot linked. And so you can click on them, and they blow up with often text explanations down below and other uh, visual information that's available that you can interact with. And, it, and this, this is true for each lesson within each topic within each module of the HIV curriculum. And with something this uh, kind of, of this scope and scale, it's important to really figure out how am I doing and where am I in the curriculum for the individual learner, because it's likely that they're not going to be able to complete this in one sitting. And this is where the progress tracker comes into play. So for each topic and lesson within a module um, will kind of populate uh, as I complete those. And so I'm always, when I leave and come back, I always know exactly where I am and what my progress is. Now this is a very rich environment for the individual learner, but we know that learning work is often organized in groups. This is true of residency programs that are organized according to R1, R2, R3, R4, and so on, um, where they have groups of individuals who they want to kind of move through material in a systematic fashion. Uh, clinical training programs is another, PA programs, nurse practitionership programs, nursing programs, medical school programs, and then, of course, regional uh, workshops and trainings that the uh, AETC provides to community-based providers. This is my last slide before turning it over to Shanette. Um, and just, just a word about why this group-based learning is important. Uh, first of all, it really enables new training models like the flipped classroom. It allows people to establish baseline knowledge for participants before they hit the classroom and then primes them for interaction and discussion. And it also provides a shared knowledge core and a conceptual understanding within the group that are based on the latest guidelines and research. So at this time, I would just like to turn it over to Shanette uh, to go through the group functionality. Shanette? Hi. Can you guys hear me OK? Yep. We hear you fine. Okay. Great. So um, thank you all for having me on this call. Um, and I'm going to try to go through the slides. Did it move for you all, too? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. So I'm going to go over how groups can be utilized within the National HIV um, curriculum, but I want to first give a disclaimer that this is how I use the group functions for Maytech, Illinois. Um, other LPs may use them differently um, and for different functions. So my purpose was to talk about the group functionality, what we specifically use it for, and um, how it benefits Maytech for Illinois. 
Primarily, um, I use the National HIV Curriculum for my HIV Interprofessional Education Program. We don't use all of the modules, which you will see on some of the screenshots that I have uh, later on in this presentation, but we pulled out the most important pieces that we wanted them to go over for a week of curriculum that we had designated for them. Um, we have also started using it for our practice transformation clinics. So Illinois, we have two uh, practice transformation clinics, which you will see when you log in, well, when I show the screenshot, um, that we have a, a group for um, both of our practice transformation clinics. And in that, what we can do is um, we have talked to both of our clinics about if they needed any physicians that needed additional training that they can use the National HIV curriculum as a basis um, for to starting them on their way. Um, another way that we use the National HIV curriculum is that we receive requests from agencies. So for example, a um, very large agency that we have here is Lindell Christian Health Center. Sometimes they want us to come out and just do a really basic um, HIV 101, and it may be for three, five, or 12 people, or many clinics around the Illinois area may want us to do that. And we refer them to the um, National HIV curriculum for that request and tell them that, you know, their staff can take the modules on their own time. We can set it up wherein we only want them to focus on possibly one module, two modules, or three modules, depending on. Um, what their position is, uh, as well as we can uh, promote them to a manager, which I will show you as well later on, where in the clinic themselves can actually check to see what staff actually completed the trainings or the modules that they went through. As well as we have a personal request one. So sometimes we get a request like maybe from people who are just interested in learning more about HIV um, or who are interested in pursuing the HIV world and is not in the HIV health profession yet, so they don't come to any of our core trainings. But we just like more additional information, and we refer them to the National HIV Curriculum for that as well. Some other uses that I have heard um, the curriculum has been used for is the minority Asian initiative. So some LPs have connected um, clinics in their MAI uh, to take the training as well as some clinician scholar programs have used the um, NHC for um, their education. So I'm now going to show you a variety of screenshots of how to set up your group within the National HIV Curriculum's website. Um, the first thing you would do is sign into your account or register for an account, which is located in the upper right-hand corner um, where the red box is shown. Once there, you can create a new group by entering in the group's name and answering the th three questions related to why you are creating this group. And once that information is completed, if you would like, you can also be assigned a group code. Um, this would be useful to post on possibly like your LP's website for people who are interested in tracking progress with your LP, and they will use that code to join a group you created. So that is a way you can make um, your National HIV curriculum public. Another option um, is that you can set the group up and invite users only by email. Uh, which I will show you really quickly here. Uh, so this is, so as you can see here, I named the group the Interprofessional Hello. Collaborative Practice. Hello? I'm good. Oh, okay. Um, and then I answered the questions below. I concluded a sample of what I put there just to show you how easy it is um, to answer those questions. And after inputting that information, you will click on Create Group, um, and the group will be automatically created. This is a new addition because just recently um, that function was updated. Before, when you were creating groups, you would have to receive approval from the NCRC, and that would take approximately, they were really quick. I know when I did it, about a day. It may take one or two days. But now the groups are automatically created, and you can set up your group and start right away. Um, 
So here is my groups, as you can see. Um, I have currently four groups right now, and the one that I'm going to talk about today is the one that I use the most, which is for my interprofessional collaborative practice in HIV um, class. We have about 27 students in Illinois across eight different disciplines that we do interprofessional um, collaborative practice. As a reminder, could everyone please mute your phones or your computer speakers? So as soon as you create your group, the first thing that you'll see when you open up the page is your group name along with your role in the group, which will be displayed at the top. And if you see in the right-hand corner, I'm the owner of that group, so you have the management capabilities of that group. And like I said, I will also show you how you can assign another manager so all the responsibility won't have to be on yourself. Second, um, there are four tabs which I use the most, which is Home, Progress, Analytics, and Numbers. And that is how you interact with your group from those tabs. And those tabs um, listed will depend on a person's role. So if it was on a user's end, they will probably have different tabs so they could see their progress and analytics. A little bit about what Kent was talking about. Um, a cool thing is that um, another great feature is the recent, recent activity news feed. Um, here you'll be able to see how new people accept invitations or see when they accept new invitations, they progress through modules, take quizzes, etc. And then lastly, you can see the owner and any manager that is assigned, assigned to the group in the toolbar to the left. You can't see my name, but I'm hitting, <laughs> hidden under that box right there. And I also have assigned Mary Keene, um, who is also a manager for my interprofessional collaborative practice. She's a co-instructor. So she has access to view the group, and I'll go a little bit over that. So after assessing the group, of course, the first thing you would want to do is add users, which is a fairly simple process to do. And you can do so by, one, either inviting one user at a time, or you can also enter multiple users here. Um, you will then personalize a message to the learners and send the link so that they can register and be added to your group. Finally, this dashboard at the top shows you how many users you have active. So as you can see, I invited a total um, amount of 35 members. I have 33 learners um, who have accepted the invitation, and then there's three pending. And I will show you a screenshot of that. So here's a screenshot showing um, the active learnings, the pending invitations, and lastly, the management team. Uh, management team roles can be assigned after inviting people. So what I did was I invited Mary Keene, and once she signed up, I assigned her a manager. Um, this person will be able to access, have access to add learners, delete learners, view progress, view scores. Um, adding a manager is also beneficial in other clinics, as I said, such as if a clinic wants to assign someone other than yourself to track staff process, progress through the slides. So, for example, if you were using a practice transformation clinic or a request from a different agency, um, you would be able to do that. I think I, a slide was missed. I wanted to talk about the rationale of using the uh, NHC, and I don't know if I skipped over that quickly or it was missed, but the curriculum is really comprehensive. I really love it. Um, it's very easy to navigate through the website, as you can see. Um, it's also made for all learners, um, wherein we're able to track the progress, and we receive credit for doing the least amount of work. You know, as an LP, the only thing we're doing is really adding emails <laughs> and um, ensuring that other individuals go on. And at the end of this, towards the end of my presentation, I will talk to you all about how we receive credit um, through virtual forum for our um, learners that all go through the NHC. Um, let me go to the next slide. So there are two ways to manage your group, um, in the, which is in the progress and the analytics tabs. And I'm going to show you some cool features in both of them. Um, so this is the learner's progress um, in the progress tab on the course modules. And uh, we're looking here at one student. 
we can see here that um, with his quiz, he had about, he took three attempts at the quiz. Um, his first attempt, he received a score, two out of five, which is 40, and then um, he took the quiz two additional times. Um, in order to receive credit, what we told the students is that they must receive a score of 80% or better um, on each of the quizzes, which is very much the same progress that um, the NHC designates for people to receive CNE or CME credits. Um, here's another student um, who took the question bank. Um, and these are the questions. Um, Instead of the course modules, these are the question bank. And you can also see at the top that the student was able to complete 100% as she progressed through the slide. So we require that the students complete 100% of the module as well as take the quiz. And here we have her two scores. We can see her attempt one and her attempt two for the scores, um, which she did very well at. So, the um, coolest feature is the analytics uh, for the question bank. And this shows, I'm sorry, let me, I don't know. All right, here we go. For some reason, I'm skipping slides. OK. Um, the coolest features are the uh, analytics for the question bank in there, because it gives you a detailed view of how everyone has progressed through the slides, um, I'm sorry, through the modules. And you can see that um, we had a total of 20 hours logged um, for any student that went through our modules. We didn't have the students go through all the modules. They only focused on modules one, four, and five. But all of the students that we had spent a total of 20 hours on it, and they went over them um, through two days. Um, and this is also a time to take a look at stuff you may need to reinforce with your um, students. And you can do that also by individualized questions. So the National HIV curriculum, they also um, have the questions group by level of difficulty. Um, and as you can see, um, for the questions answered, and the least difficult, 45% of them answered them correctly. Um, the first time. And the harder the questions get, um, the the scores um, drastically change, which is great. And you can look at that also to be able to manage your group and take a look at what specific questions uh, that they are answering wrong. And you may need to spend some more time with your students on those questions. Um, this is the question bank. So this organ, oh, for some reason, OK. So this is a question bank, and um, this manages, this has a list of questions that the uh, learners were able to take. So on here, um, you can see that 13 out of 14 of the, of the participants got the question on HIV testing in pregnant women in labor correctly. Um, and it was a moderately difficult question. But if you want to take a, a closer look, say if that was a question that most students got wrong, you can actually pull up the question just by clicking on it right there in the analytics of the question bank. You can look at the answer and see if this is something that you may need to review more so with the students. And last but not least, the analytics. Um, they do have a course modules coming up, and I'm really excited about that and how that's going to look. Um, and they suggest if you have any suggestions for statistics you'd like to see in the course modules, that they are willing to take it um, and make it right. So before I leave, um, I also want to talk about something that Kent didn't cover, which is the clinical challenges and how it can apply specifically to LPs. Um, they have a clinical challenge section, which I found awesome when I learned about. And I thought that this would be great to use with possibly LPs, practice transformation clinics, because on it, someone can submit a challenge and talk about um, uh, any challenge that they have based along the modules um, that they're having a, a they need expert advice or expert opinions or what would you do. and 
people who have registered for the National HIV Curriculum can actually answer the questions and give their expert opinions on the clinical challenge. So as you can see here, this is a clinical challenge with antiretroviral therapy. Um, and here, um, I don't, is someone progressing? Let me go back. Okay. Here you can see that um, there were 70 responses from registered members um, who gave their expert opinions on what would they recommend changing um, the patient's regimen to based off of the question. And 39 of them were MD, 31 of them were registered as not MD. Um, in addition to that, you have expert opinions that um, two physicians have answered. So I thought that was great. You can email these clinical challenges to someone like your practice transformation clinic and get them to participate on it as well. Um, lastly, not, but not least, I want to talk to you all about reporting in virtual forum. Um, and again, I'll make the disclaimer that this is how Maytech Illinois reports um, when we have people go through the National HIV curriculum, and it may be just unique to Illinois, but people who are interested in using it, maybe they can um, take some tips and you report their encounters for the National HIV curriculum in virtual form as well. So if we have an individual invite, say it's for that one person who is just looking to learn more about HIV, or if you just have one physician who contacted your office and wanted to, um, who didn't have time to attend any of your core curriculums or your core trainings, you can send them an invitation to um, the National HIV Curriculum, and we will create one ER per PIP. So we will, we'll, we will create a program um, ER through virtual form, send them the link and connect the National HIV Curriculum to them so they can go through and sign up. If it's a group invite, we'll create one ER per group. So that means that everyone in a group is most likely going to be taking the same modules and um, you will award them all of the exact same credit hours for the entire group. So once the registration link for the ER is complete, we send the registration link for the PIF to learners. Um, as stated, learners, they must take the modules as requested. So if it's a group and we only assign them group um, modules 1, 3, and 5, or 1, 2, and 3, um, they take those modules. Um, they must complete 100% of the module and receive at least 80% score on the quiz or took the question bank and received at least 80% on there as well. Um, the hours, the way that we document them is in self-study, distance-based, and archive, and it's one hour per topic. That one hour per topic was given to us by the NHC that each of those modules that have several topics in them, it takes about one hour to go through them. So that is how we will award our topics. Um, and I think that is all that I have. That is all that I have. And Kent will now be going over. Oh, one more thing I wanted to add is that um, NHC, they actually just updated their website. And I see that there are they, that they are trying to incorporate PIFs into it, which may make it easier for some LPs to report out on PIFs. Um, I don't know if Kent would be able to speak to that, but he's going to go over group enhancements um, that is there. I'm just going to jump in real quick. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Before um, Kent goes over um, the next steps for um, group functionality, I see um, Andrew has been very busy responding to, um, to questions in the chat room. Um, is there, are there, before we move forward, is there, are there any questions, burning questions right now that Perhaps Kent um, or uh, Jeanette can respond to um, that have not been answered. I'm trying to follow the thread here. Um, and it looks like they've all been answered. Um, I think I think we're I think we're good to go. Okay, Kent, go ahead. Sorry. 
Um, the formatting in this slide got a little bit messed up, uh, but there was just one thing I wanted to highlight and then really want to turn it over for discussion. Um, and uh, Shanette talked about this a little bit, um, but the kind of the, the distinction between the kind of roles that um, are rolled out now in the group management, um, and you just have to forgive the little people aren't lined up with the uh, with the bullet points there, but uh, there are really four uh, four types. Um, one is an owner who owns the group and can delegate tasks to others. Uh, what we found is that many time uh, many times residency directors or training directors uh, want to own the group, but it's often coordinators that do the work of inviting and removing learners and viewing uh, kind of group results. And then there is also a role, um, as Jeanette highlighted, for evaluators who can view aggregate scores and results but not invite or remove learners. And then, of course, learners who track their own progress and see who else in the group has been logged in or working but not any other details about that group. They don't see anybody else's progress. So I just really wanted to highlight that piece um, but really wanted to kick it back to, um, to Judy and uh, see if you want to facilitate questions, we're happy to field them. Um, thank you very much, Jeanette, for providing a very concrete examples of how you use it and tying it into the curriculum. I thought that was excellent. Um, Judy, back to you. Thanks, uh, Kent. Um, I see a lot of the questions that it seem to be appearing in the chat room have to do with CEs um, and obtaining certification. Do either one of you want to speak to some of that a little bit? Um, um, how soon they're being um, awarded, um, if they are available, if there's pharmacology credits coming. Um, the, um, sure. Um, so Andrew, Andrew has been uh, has been answering these questions in the chat box. Um, there are. Uh, CNE pharmacology hours at the advanced practice level, level and uh, in the future we're going to hope to provide ACPE approved pharma hours. Um, continuing, when you do something again of this scope and scale that's targeted toward clinicians, um, it is really challenging to meet all of the different CE requirements of the different accreditation bodies. Um, and so we are working very diligently to try to make sure to dot our I's and cross our T's to make that available. It is a gargantuan task. So we, um, we are working very hard to make sure that not only nurses and physicians um, get their C uh, continuing education credits or contact hours, um, but also pharmacy and other clinicians as well. And we just beg for a little bit of patience as we work that out. Okay. Other questions? Are there any, is there anyone that wants to just jump in on the line and ask questions, or are we just going to... Uh, there was one here um, about, from Greg, which I believe Andrew answered, but I just wanted to read it out loud in case you can't see it. Once an individual accepts, does their previous progress automatically download into the group? Um, or are there additional steps? So I guess he's asking um, if you're inviting folks to join the group, if they've already, um, and, and Greg, please um, correct me if I have your question, if I'm reading it wrong, but um, once they've been invited to join the group, um, if they've already um, accessed the site, um, the, is their information automatically populated into their no group um, function? You know, it, it, it is, um, and I think Andrew answered that correctly in the chat box. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's really a privilege to have you on here and answering these questions as we have the oral conversation. Um, but yes, when, when somebody joins a group, they bring with them all their scores and progress. So um, what we've worked, really worked hard at doing is establishing clear roles and making sure that everybody knows what those roles are, um, what their roles and responsibilities are. And so um, uh, just like uh, an owner has their role, learners have their roles and responsibilities as well. And one of them is to uh, think diligently about whether or not they in indeed do want to join a group, to consent to be part of the group, because all of their progress and scores uh, come with them uh, when they join the new group. So I hope that helps clarify some things. Um, but yes, uh, be available for questions and happy to field others. 
Um, Judy, I see a question from Clint who says, when creating a group, is there a registration link that's sent out via virtual form at the registration? Um, and in other words, how are participants enroll after they're registered? So it can be done two ways. You can actually set up um, in virtual form that it can be snapped to the National HIV website where then they will go on and register. So if you want them to go through virtual form first, that is fine, and then do and then snap it to um, the National HIV curriculum. You can do, go about doing it that way. Or you can do it on the back end by inviting people to your group and then collecting a PIF from them afterwards and you manually entering in the information for each of the learners that signed up to participate in your group. I'd like to address just an issue that uh, Mary, Mary Beth is highlighting, and Shanette, maybe you can con uh, comment on this in just a bit. Uh, but she's asking you specifically um, if the members, if your group members work, are working on the same modules at the same time, or if they select modules that they're interested in and complete on their own timeline. Let me just say that from a technical perspective, uh, we're agnostic on the matter, and uh, people can do what they want. But I think different programs do it differently. How did you do it, Shanette? Sure, that's a great question, Mary Beth. Um, so for the HIPEP Interprofessional Education Group, we assigned them modules to work on because, of course, that is a class that students have enrolled. Um, so we assigned them three very specific modules to work on. We didn't have them go too much into the pharmacology side because that can be a little um, overwhelming, especially since we had eight different disciplines. So no, we had we select the modules. And anytime if we are setting up a group, um, before we do, we talk to that individual or even that agency about what goals they are looking to achieve. So if they are looking to just get a basic understanding of HIV, we're not going to say, suggest that they complete all five modules within the National HIV curriculum. It will probably just be one and probably like, you know, the first one, HIV, um, I think, which is screening and diagnosis, and then the last one, which is yeah. HIV prevention, is what we will suggest. Um, so it just depends on what the group members are looking or seeking to learn is how we select what modules um, they complete or suggest. But at any time, any individual learner is welcome to complete all of the modules if they would like. Hello? Can Hello. you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, hi. This is uh, Lydia Barakat from Yale University. Uh, we have an HIV training track, and uh, we also would like to use the National HIV Curriculum to enhance training to all residents, uh, PA students, and APRN. And the question I have is for Kent or uh, for uh, Jeanette, for group learning. So if we do, uh, you know, we're planning to do individual level learning, the uh, group learning, and the flipped classroom learning. Uh, and for the group learning, the question I have is, is there any way to track CE for the group, or how can we get the group at the certification that they finish certain modules? That's a great question. Uh, hello, Lydia. It's, it's good to hear your voice again. Um, this is Ken. Um, and uh, let, me, let me parse out your question into three subparts, if I may, and you can let me know at the end if I covered it. The first is um, about uh, CE and if the group leader can actually track the CE that an individual has had. The answer to that is no, and here's why. Um, CE is actually given to specific individuals, and that's governed by the credentialing body for that uh, continuing education unit or contact hours, and that's, that's really private information. So that's, uh, that's a quick answer there. However, um, there is a certificate of completion that, uh, that an individual can get that's independent of the CE, and we have many people who, um, uh, who simply print out or share the uh, certificate of completion uh, with their residency directors um, to, in, to indicate that they've uh, completed 
uh, the particular coursework that they've been asked to complete. And it's, all, it's also incremental, so uh, it, it just lists the, the lessons and modules that have been completed. Um, so that's great. And then, um, and then the third thing is that uh, you indeed, though, do see that they, as a group leader, that they went through the, um, that they went through the curriculum and the specific things that they did. So you know you have access as an, as an owner um, which people have actually completed which modules, independent of whether or not they actually applied for, CM, for continuing education credits. Did, does that help, Lydia? Yes, wonderful. I'm, I'm very excited about the group uh, function that you created. And Lydia, if I may, um, because I know that you have such an incredible um, uh, program out there on the East Coast, um, what uh, people often ask, is there a technical limit to the number of people that we can put in a group? And the answer to that is no. Um, but we really encourage people to create groups that are for specific purposes, for the unit of analysis that makes sense according to the organization of the learning that's occurring. Let me give you an example. If they're residents, uh, an incoming residency class, they can be a group. It doesn't matter if they're two or 50. Um, they can create, uh, they can all be put in a group. But um, we really encourage people to kind of break them out from, let's say, the R2 or the second year residents. Or if there's a class um, that, uh, that's recurring year after year, that the, the, the each class um, year after year be created in, in an independent group. And then uh, we hope to work on analytics that would be able to actually provide aggregate statistics across groups, but that's uh, in the future and we're uh, not there yet. And I don't want to make any promises um, um, on that regard, but we're hoping to be able to do that. So I hope that helps set the context. Jeanette, did you have any anything to add on, on groups and Lydia's questions? Uh, I think Andrew, he just answered it in the chat room. I do know that there is a limit of 50 in a group, but Andrew is saying that if you would like more capacity in 50, they will be willing to work with you on that. Um, so yeah, that's all. Um, that's I just wanted to thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to let everyone know that it is uh, 146, and we can continue the conversation if folks are still are available to, to hang on. Um, if not, uh, we thank you for joining the call, and um, the next call will be in September. But we can continue talking um, for those who are, who are able. Um, um, I just wanted to uh, throw this out to either to, I guess, to Kent. Um, there's a question in, in the chat room from Debbie if there are any modules in Spanish. So we do, we do get that question from time to time. Um, right now, we are an English-only site. Um, it's uh, simply all we can handle right now to keep everything updated. Uh, to give you an example is that, um, that, that the site is constantly in continual updating. And we try to get things up very, very quickly when the research changes and when research comes out. Um, so uh, doing that is just really we have our hands full. And we're not, uh, we're not funded at this time for kind of multi-language stuff. Um, but uh, so, so that, that's there. Um, but uh, feel free to kind of reach out and give opinions to us. Shoot us an email, and uh, we're happy to log that along with the other feedback as we map things out. Let's see, did we cover everything? Um... And I want to highlight that, uh, that Andrew uh, provided a caveat to, to my answer that group management does see whether the individual people claim CME or CNE. So that, that feature has just been added, and so that, that's a correction to what I said earlier. So there are a lot of um, questions about whether or not this call will be, uh, is being recorded and will be posted. It will be available on our website. Um, and you can access it there um, after the call, maybe within the next hour or so. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'll, and I'll send out an email to everyone to let them know that it is there. So, so Nancy, yeah, you'll get the email. <laughs> so this is Kent. I'm going to need to sign off. It's been a real privilege to be with you here today, and uh, please feel free to uh, uh, 
send questions to either Shanette or myself. Uh, perhaps we could funnel those through Judy, if you'd be willing. And uh, it's just a privilege to be with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes. Kent, and thank you, Shanette. Do you have thank any last words? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I really do appreciate the National HIV curriculum, and I enjoy using it. Um, so thank you all for having me. If you guys do have questions, feel free to contact me through Judy, or my personal email is on there as well. Yep. Thank you both. Um, I just wanted to move along and just say our next call again is in September. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or thoughts about new topics, please feel free to email me, and we look forward to seeing or hearing from you uh, soon. Have a great summer, everyone. We'll find you out later. Thank you. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.